buenos días. Damos comienzo. Hello, a... good afternoon. We are beginning now this webinar on constanting integrating knowledge. This is a joint effort from the International Agricultural Institute. I am Eduardo Tramper from the Vegetal Protection Program. I represent several programs working together for this webinar. For the formal opening of this webinar, we will hear our National Director, Ariel Pereda. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Welcome, everyone for the, to the constanting integrating knowledge webinar the idea is to provide to everyone in the world of academia and the production sector all of the progress and proposals we have as from inta with our professionals knowledgeable in the topic we have been working at inta with this topic and this is one of the several tools we use to disseminate the information and come up with alliances to work towards this issue of constanting. I want to thank the whole team. There are so many units of INTA throughout the country working on the topic, specialists, researchers, national coordinated programs, together with the experimental regional stations. It is always a pleasure to try and work uh, with you all in order to work towards this sanitary emergency with constanting. Let me once again emphasize our thanks to the, all of the INTA teams trying to provide knowledge for smart decisions in order to go through this emergency. This is our role as from INTA to obtain the information, produce it, share it, so that decisions made it at the different sectors and decision-making spaces are knowledge-based decisions. So. Without any further ado, I understand we're going to have a great day with a much expected webinar. We have more than 700 people present with us. So as from the very beginning, this is a success. Just that and to wish you the best of success. We want to thank all of the those you participating and the speakers, of course, as well. Now a brief introduction for the webinar. We want to thank the presence of all of the audience here eh, through and uh, through YouTube, including countries invited by Fontagro. We have an amazing intensity of the constanting and this has triggered articulated work as from different regional centers, research centers, agencies for rural extension and other groups and the work of all the of the national team. We have different environmental productive situations with much heterogeneity throughout our territory and different problems of course why do we come up with this webinar we believe this is a good opportunity to integrate some of the aspects that the institution is focusing on as a contribution to next instances of interaction with other institutions entities chambers and associations from this sector now we will very quickly and briefly introduce the program that we have for today's webinar. First of all, after this opening, we will come up with the different blocks. 
pass constanting and its vector basic guidelines for management with presentations from those you see on the screen, Maria de la Paz Jiménez Pérez, Karina Torrico, and also Macarena Casuso and Marcelo Drueta. The next block has to do with incidents and symptoms. And the question posed is how environmental factors have an impact on yield with presentations by Ferreguti, Mercado and Rodriguez, and then the big issue of the crop that much concerns so many people, so many producers with Facundo Ferraguti, Alejandro Radrizani and Fernando Scaramuzza. And then the final blog, Reflections for the Future. We have the participations of Juan Pablo Lloele, Maria de la Paz, Kineme Pesis, Macarena Casuso, and Marcelo Drueta. Then we will have a Q&A session at the very end of the session so that you can write your questions on the YouTube channel. We have our collaborators gathering your questions and we will respond them at the Q&A at the end. Without any further ado, we will be beginning with the first presentation that has to do with the first topic of corn stunting and its vector basic management guidelines. We begin then with Karina Torrico, I believe. Hi, hello, let me share my screen. Good. Very well. Good morning, everyone. I am Karina Torrico, and I'm here to talk about constanting and its vector. What I'm going to tell you about the features of the constanting, how this has pro how this has progressed in Argentina, the spiroplasm, general symptoms, presence and incidence in this campaign, and tell you what happened and the results we had from the previous campaign. Karina, please speak up so that we can hear you better. Thank you. All right. So corn stunting is caused by a set of pathogens, four pathogens, two bacteria, a cytoplasm and spiroplasm. The bacteria are molecule class and they are do not have cellular pairs. They are the pathogens for constanting, as we see, are the MRFV and a new virus detected just a few campaigns ago that is called the May Street mosaic virus in sweet corn in Santa Fe province was detected. These four pathogens together or in isolation are transmitted by the same vector, the leaf hopper, Dalbulus mitis, it's a saicadale, and it is known because it exclusively feeds from corn. Some of the features to be had into account is that the pathogens do not are not conveyed through seed, pollen, or mechanically. These four alone or in combination can cause the disease of constanting. What we find in Argentina in the field is spiroplasma. And the only host in Argentina for this is corn. It is a systemic disease affecting physiology, nutrition, and the development of the corn plant. 
Let's see the distribution in Argentina. This disease of Constantin is a disease from the American continent. It was detected as from the south of the US all the way up to Argentina. In Argentina, it was adapted in 1991, Santiago del Estero and Tucumán at the northwest region of Argentina. Then in 1996-1997, it was detected in the northeast region, Corrientes and Chaco, and also Santa Fe province only in 20, uh, 21. It, it affects our country not only in the north, as you see above the 39 uh, south latitude parallel. In successive campaigns, we have detected its presence in these different locations. In 2003, 2004, it was detected at the core area, as you see here, all the way up to El Ario. Ascasubi on parallel 39 in the south. And uh, more recently, 2021, 2022, it was detected in the valley of Rio Negro, more to the south. What is the typical symptomatology that we can see? First, we want to say that the symptoms are observed normally after floration. There are many variables having an impact, the genetic of the material, for instance, it depends on the tolerance of the spiroplasm, the moment of infection, plants infected at emergency till V6, V5, end up with more severe symptoms. Another important variable, environmental cond conditions, mainly temperature and the presence of mixed infections. That is to say, same plant can have several pathogens associated to spiroplasm. Typical symptoms, we see these marks, longitudinal marks that go through the whole leaf. It might cover the whole of the foliar sheet, we see the uh, whitish color going up. If the material is very susceptible, you can see cut off borders or edges and the necrosis in the borders. Here we see another typical symptom are reddish edges, as we see here, as from the tip of the leave towards the base. In this case, let me show you over here. The, it's red, then chlorosis, then you see the green. It starts from the border towards the center, as from the tip towards the basis of the leaf. Then the borders or edges are impacted with necrosis, and you see the, uh, the image on the screen. We also see multiple spikes as per not. You see here stunting, uh, stunted corn, quite short. You can see this, this spike over here that has not been filled in by uh, the grain. It could be uh, corky or very soft and a decrease of weight and amount of grains. What is the data obtained from the previous campaign, 2022, 2023, about incidence and presence of spiroplasm? This is the sampling done in several localities in Cordoba province, 30 leaves of corn that were taken throughout a transect. These samples were analyzed by serology to determine the presence of spiroplasm and other viruses and the incidence was determined as a percentage of plants that uh, presented it. In Córdoba, you can see the sampling of the different localities, uh, early and late uh, seeding or sowing, 
and we see low values in the south of Córdoba. You see here the Bengolea, Nuncativo, closer to the center, Coronel Moldes. You see these locations and late uh, corn, you see Uncativo up to 20% in one of the lots in the area of Tortoral, 7% of incidents. Karina, once again, the audience as from YouTube is asking you for you to raise your voice. They hear you very low. I will. In the province of Catamarca, you see random sampling with an incidence of 85 percent up to 77 percent as well in Catamarca. And we have not found spiroplasma in these other places in Santa Fe, but see, uh, samples with symptoms were present at Reconquista. In Salta province, we see 27 percent at Las Lajitas and samples with symptoms at Talavera, in La Rioja, Santiago del Estera, in all these localities, symptomatic samples, they were all positive uh, for TSS. El Rioja, Santiago del Estera as well. What happened with this campaign, we all know, and we have suffered from what I'm going to show you. We can see here the data we have from three provinces for you to see what has happened. At Formosa, we have made random sampling in six different lots. We see this going from four to up to 80% of incidents with the presence of the virus as part of this complex of pathogens, Radofino at the 35% incidence in one of the localities. What happened at Rio Negro? In Rio Negro, we had samples done randomly in six lots, and we have observed between three to 4% in three out of six uh, lots. So if we compare this, against the report of spiroplasm in the 2021-2022 campaign has increased a bit. The same samplings were taken, and in 2022, 2021-2022, we found 3% in only one of the cases uh, with the presence of spiroplasm. And in Santa Fe, we have made these samplings, six lots, recent results in different places. We see the minimum incidence of 26 percent and 88, 100 percent, La Rubia and Hercilia. These are located Uh, at Mar Chiquita location in Santa Fe. Mar Chiquita is in Córdoba, but in the same uh, height, if you want, in the same latitude, if you see that as in the map. And we see the presence of spiroplasm in Entre Ríos and also Pergamino, but it was low there, but we have found uh, these are the cases uh, that we see here, spiroplasm in Tucumán, in La Cocha. And these on early uh, corn in uh, Córdoba, no presence of spiroplasm detected in early corn in the south of Córdoba. This is what we have so far. Let me thank everyone that we're contacting us, we are trying to carry out all of the analysis of the samples you have brought us. We are working on that right now. Thank you very much. And with this, we move to uh, the Dr. Maria de la Paz Jimenez Pesci, who will uh, give us her presentation. 
Okay, um, I need to start sharing my screen, please. Can you see my screen now already, Eduardo? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here on behalf of INTA. Let me thank you. And the goal for us is to uh, share with you what we know so far. What I'm going to do is to stress what the symptoms are, how can we identify them as such, and tell you that there are other symptoms that are similar in case of biotic and abiotic pathologies that are similar to them, and you will hear from physiologists in the next blog, and I will be talking to you about the scale. My name is Maria de la Paz Espechi. I have retired from INTA, but I have been working on this disease since it was detected in Intalialis in 1990 or 1991 by agronomist Dr. Luis Jerónimo Gómez, who reached out to the then Cefide, and that is how we started understanding this disease. As Karina showed us, this is the typical symptomatology of the spiroplasm, one of the four reasons behind constante. This is typical. If we see this, no uh, tests are required, but the symptoms do not appear in 100 cases. This is the uh, fine streaking, which until three or four campaigns ago did not take any part, any role in the stunting that occurred in Argentina. But for the last three to four campaigns, it is really visible. And Karine, her presentation shared some details showing that in some lots, there is more uh, virus than spiroplasm. And as we said, these symptoms are expressed when in uh, hot areas there have been early infections, when there has been high concentration of uh, inoculum, as in this campaign, and when corn is susceptible. So the symptoms we find here uh, and which we can see to the left is the uh, uh, white trays that extend to the uh, foliar sheet. And if temperatures go down, if it's cold, if we find ourselves in more temperate areas, it will go away and it will leave room to these other symptoms, which uh, Karina described, that is the reddish edges. It turns red, then yellow, and towards the center of the leaf, it's rather green. This is <clears throat> unlike what we see sometimes because of lack of nutrients, the center of the uh, um, leaf changes. But in this case, what changes is the edge towards the center. And we see this uh, disease being present in temperate areas. In our country, there is a wide temperate area where corn is uh, sowed in Argentina. And here we can see the symptoms in different parts. We can see the reddish edge towards moving towards the center. But if we see downwards, we can see the chlorotic whitish strains, which I highlighted in yellow with yellow arrows. And if we look behind in other plants, we will also be able to detect this typical symptomatology. And this will be the case in temperate zones for the spiroplasm. Normally, both in hot and temperate zones, we can see this. And again, I insist, necrotic or reddish edges that are like a 
paintbrushes going towards the center. Karina said also that there are multi spikes. This is the case in very hot. And you can also see the chlorotic uh, strays going from the bottom towards uh, the border. On the right, you can see the multi spikes with the red edge and also the red yellow uh, strains, typical of pyroplasm and the necrotic edge. This is in the province of Chaco in 2029. And this is no surprise to us. And this is no surprise for us. This is 2024. This is the typical symptoms Dr. Torrico just explained. Reddish, yellowish towards the center. And in some cases, we see other uh, features depending on the germoplasm being expressed in a way or other. This was uh, taught to me by a Peruvian colleague. And it means that the cob extends way longer than the rest of the spike. But the problem with the disease is that the grain does not grow to the full. And why? Because the two bacteria, phytoplasm and spiroplasm, live in the form of the plant and, and produce this. The phloem fully blocked by the spiroplasm in this case, when NR3 and NR4 plants have all the phloems blocked, the plant attempts at uh, growing the grain from the photosynthesis going on in the leaf. It doesn't succeed, it stops growing the grain, the grain becomes uh, demuted and the plant surrenders before. Uh, so we can see that the stunted plant yields some weeks before. This is what I told you. The, the fine striation was detected in Argentina in 1984 by Do Campo who created IFIBE within INTA, but with low prevalence until the COVID uh, pandemic, where in 2021 and 2021, high spiroplasm frequencies were noted. In Brazil, this virus is uh, quite widespread, and in Central America, it creates more losses than spiroplasm. And for the fine striations, we can see the symptoms seven to 10 days after the infection, whereas with spiroplasm symptoms can be observed 40 to 45 days after the infection. And these are plants infected with two pathogens, the fine striation and spiroplasm. If we uh, look them in a translucent way, we can see the fine striation and on the right, we can see it rather purplish or reddish, but we can also see clearly the striations of the spiroplasm. And this is the situation existing from Salta to the center of Santa Fe. Why the symptoms of uh, corn stunting change? And why have we asked the experts to join us today because in any disease and even more so with this, symptoms change accord to, according to the pathogen that were transmitted. They change according to the time of the infection, as Dr. Torrico said, if uh, the infection occurred in, in the plant, 
it will be expressed through certain symptoms. If the infection happened in B11, B12, other symptoms will be expressed and probably there will no, uh, there won't be any yield uh, declines, except if the germoplasm is acceptable or in case of high environment temperature. In that case, the impact on the yield will be significant as well. Another major factor, and that is the one we have had, is the presence of leaf hoppers. The presence of leaf hoppers, according to Luis Geronimo Gomez, the one who found it in Argentina, said that he had never seen populations of leaf hoppers as he had seen in this campaign for this year. CREA groups located in the south of Santa Fe asked for a scale to come up with symptomatic assessments. I uh, resorted to a publication from Lechuk, and we have put up six degrees. Let us focus on each one of them. But it is important to note that in every case, except in the case of typical situations, we need to have a look at two of the symptoms we have described. And in the case of early yield or early death, I refer to plants that never grew enough. That is that they remain short. This is scale number two. Just and we start to see something going into the foliar sheet and we can see something over there. Uh, symptom number three is this. This uh, red, yellow and green streaks. Level number four are the typical striation of the spiroplasm led stunting. Here we can see the typical striation. And level five are all other deformations. When the plant is subject to any type of deformation, the impact on its yield will depend on the hybrid. If hybrid is more or less tolerant, and what we see in that case, red sheet, multi-spike, tillers in plants. We can see if we open it up that there are some ends of the spike, that the spike is not long enough. In the case of the spiroplasm, we can see that the spike developed, but it is short. We see a shorter height both in the spiroplasm and in fine uh, streaks. And here we can see production of a sheets in husks. We can see both here, infected and not infected plants. And level six is a plant that could never grow because it got infected very early on. So let me tell you that there are a number of alterations and a number of symptoms we are seeing in this season that have nothing to do with stunting. There are a number of viruses we are not focusing on, which individually or combined can result in similar symptoms. In Argentina, we have the full set of pathogens and the ones you see in yellow are the ones specific of stunting, but all others are the ones conveyed by seeds, by acres, by trips, etc. There are also mildews, that is uh, fungi, that create uh, symptoms that are similar to those of stunting and thus create confusions. There are some also oh, some genetic uh, stains, and there are also some stress-related, and we will leave it to physiologists to tell us more about it. And with this, I would like to thank you. Very well, thank you, Paz, for your presentation. And with this,
We move on to the last presentation in this blog um, with Macarena Casuso from Inta Las Leñas. We cannot hear you, Macarena. We cannot hear you and you're not sharing into presentation mode. Okay, so I am going to talk to you about the career together with Marcelo Reta. Only, uh, uh, I will be the one doing the talking. Well, the Elmus Maidu is part of the Adelaide. It uh, creates two black uh, strains surrounded by a white a halo, a small inside, three to four millimeters, and a hay yellow in color. It creates two types of damages. One is direct by feeding from corn with its suction a mechanism, it creates micro perforations and it also secretes a sticky substance that is laid on the sheet. And the damage created by the female is such that when it lays its eggs endophytically on the um, uh, laminate creates micro lesions on the uh, leaves. And the most significant damage, uh, that is the indirect one, it conveys the stunt related diseases, which both are uh, the previous speakers referred to. It is uh, very mobile. And in high populations, it can be found in the bonding areas between the uh, laminae and the stem. And we can find it distributed across the plant. Regarding its biological cycle, uh, females lay uh, 15 to 20 eggs on a daily basis throughout their adult lives. And they can lay 100 to 28 to 600 eggs throughout their lives. And adults uh, live from 30 to uh, 130 days and the legs are uh, late endophytically. That means we cannot see them as is the case with other uh, plates because they are late either in groups from four to 19 throughout the medium line or in an isolated fashion as you can see on the screen in the foyer parenchyma. And this egg period goes from four to eight days, depending on environmental conditions. And from these eggs, nymphs appear, which undergo five stages. And you can distinguish the nymphs from adults because you will not find those black spots. And also the color of the nymphs is rather um, brunette, and this discriminate, uh, lets you discriminate names from adults. You can find them also on the other side of the leaves, and this period goes up to 17 days, depending on environmental conditions. The whole cycle lasts from 25 to 35 days, depending on environmental conditions. The biotic uh, potential linked to temperature, according to uh, some others, Arslan Wakil, 
prefers that uh, around minus five uh, degrees Celsius, eggs are uh, not viable from 10 to 15 degrees. This means don't make it to adults. And with the interaction of the pathogen, At uh, 23 degrees, a uh, female can create 160 individuals with temperature increases. This tells us that low temperatures, and we could also include high temperatures as well, infer in the different stages of development. Regarding <clears throat> how they feed, it has been proven that they feed and reproduce only in corn, but they have survival strategies in the counter campaign, and you can find it in brachiaria, in weeds such as sorghum talepo, in wheat, and we can um, also find them in ornamental plants. As regards the pathogens, the leaf hopper needs to be feeding on an infected plant during a period of time. For instance, for CSEs, it needs to feed for one hour from a plant that is infected. MBS, two hours, and MRFB, six hours. After the pathogen is acquired, this mix where the instant in fluids and it circulates systematically throughout the insect. This is, uh, these are the different times according to the pathogens. After this period of latency, the pathogen reaches the glands in the mouth and the pathogen is transmitted by the leaf hopper. Once the pathogens colonize the phloem, turn that plant in a source of infection. In the case of spiroplasm, CSS, it could happen in a period of between nine to 40 days. On the basis of everything that was said, we indicate that Manage, cultural management is very important. Voluntary plants are to be eliminated from the uh, area. We have been studying this with some producers and there are laws of crops. In the previous campaign in lots where they had a lot of spikes laws, we saw the continuous emergency of voluntary plants of corn and this generates descendants that we need to remember that the female deposits up to 600 eggs through her life and if they are infective and normally if they are infective infective females have a more survival capacity through the winter so they can transmit these diseases to voluntary plants and depending on the time that they remain on the lots or how well the lot was worked on, the new nymphs are born healthy, but when they feed from plants with a pathogen, they acquire it as well, and you end up with a lot more infected leaf hoppers for the next crop. Basis on the work of Olivera et al from 2003, where they evaluated under controlled conditions, different densities of adults of Dalbulus maidis, one uh, leaf copper against five. And what was observed, as we see, is that this caused an increase of Dalbulus maidis that duplicated the number of symptomatic plants on this basis and also on the migration that these 
pests have from 20 to 30 kilometers in active flights or even higher distances favored by air currents, according to these authors, is that we recommend to have a sanitary period that extends beyond 90 days, considering the biology of the vector that can live up to 80 days and that it can migrate towards later crops. So we want to avoid uh, stepped uh, crops in high infestation areas, or as we can see, they seek refuge in Grameenia. And if we have loss of crops, and we have uh, the leafhoppers circulating, they can also install themselves in voluntary plants. Another aspect is genetic management. There are different behaviors of the spiroplasm virus, but in this campaign we have observed, as you see, different things um, according uh, as relates to the corn stunting, we cannot take this as a basis for the behavior of virus because we also have in the area two types of stress. Hydric stress here at Chaco, for instance, this happens in February and March 2024. We had a relevant hydric stress and also thermal stress situations that will also uh, be uh, considered by other specialist in this uh, webinar. Chemical management is also important. The seeding therapies, the work by Oliveira, assessing the efficiency of the treatment of seeds for controlling Dalbulus maidis, assessed at 12, 9, 16, and 23 days after the emergency. And you can see that after two days, 80% in one hour, 80% of control of adults of Dalbolus maidis it takes place. And this is increased as the adults are exposed through time to the insecticides. At, in nine days, they need longer to kill 90% of the population. This in 16 days needs to feed for 12 hours to reach uh, the killing of adults, the mortality of adults, and it takes a whole day in 10 days time to reach the mortality of 70% of individuals. So for the case of the seeding therapies, we need to know the necessary time to kill uh, the most of the dalbulus because in the field at the same time, the life hoppers die because they eat the insecticides, they could have transmitted these molecules to healthy plants. We have been for long campaigns at INTA carrying out assessments to understand the behavior of this pest. One of these has to do with foliage applications with different insecticides. This was part of an internship of Abigail Gonzalez, where we did sequential applications in maize parcels, and we had a witness V2, V2 plus V4, V2 before V6, and V2 before V6 and V8. We saw that the witness had the higher amount of insects average per plant vis-a-vis um, -vis the other situations. We see that there are post movements and reinfestations uh, by the leafhoppers. Yes, we see that we have found leafhoppers even we, when we have had all four applications. So management should be regional. If a producer applies all of the management strategies and the neighbor does not, then the neighbor will be contagiating, if you want, on infesting uh, from with leafhoppers, the one that did all the work. So other, assessment, uh, other assessments need to be done with other systemic insecticides. In reproduction stage, we have 
assessed the incidence of the diseases and even when we had the applications of insecticides in the plants with different treatment they still had symptoms of spiroplasm if you are here you can have an incidence that's even similar to the one of the control in this campaign it happens like with everybody we did assessments of with the different insecticides and we had erratic results vis-a-vis -vis their efficacy so we started wondering if foliage insecticides work for the control of dalbulus maidis we carried out this test also for a control treatment where the seeds a producer would normally use the application of a phloem insecticide by system as this one spiro tetramat and bifentrin which is a contact insecticide here what we can see is that 24 hours there is a control on the vector and the control increases as time goes by up to day number three we have control over 50 percent in the case of the phloem type insecticide we see that initially control in 24 hours is 50 percent and then it increases up to exceeding 80 percent in three days time in the case of the contact insecticide it presents over 40 percent control 24 hours after the application and then this control decreases up until it exists 60 percent in three days time of assessment as a summary even when the magnitude of the situation of high populations of the vector and the complex of the constant extending different productive areas is new there are several studies carried out on the vector that help us as a basis to present strategies to collaborate to lower populations to comply with the sanitary period over 90 days designing regional type strategies continuing the assessment of tolerant and resistant materials trying to find a resistant one because this year was a year with adverse environmental conditions in the different areas that leveraged the symptoms we are currently seeing continue with studies that will allow us to understand the winter behavior of the plague and to continue assessing the registry of chemical insecticides that's all i have on my side and here you have the team of Las Breñas and uh, our group from INTA. Thank you very much. Excellent, Macarena. Thank you so much for your presentation. With this, we conclude the first block that was focused mainly in the presentation of knowledge that not only INTA but other institutions have of the path of system in general and some management guidelines. Now we will go into a block with two sections that will present mainly what is the situation we are facing that we have faced in this campaign to better understand what is the analysis that is made in relation to what is happening to the impact that the issue is having in production and the interference of some other factors that are having an impact so we start with the second block specifically for incidents and symptoms and the question if it uh, environmental factors impact yield these on the hands of facundo ferraguti solana rodriguez and jorge mercado go ahead Will Solana begin, Eduardo? You begin, Facundo. Great. Good.
Dame el ok nomás. You tell me when. We see the screen. Perfect. All right, so I will try to be as brief as possible. We have had the very relevant blog on the description of the vector and the associated diseases. We are here to tell you what we have seen at the Oliveros campaign. This is experimental station Oliveros as we have uh, people from abroad. Let me tell you, this is the province of, bueno, of um, Santa Fe and here you have Oliveros. Uh, the climate is impacted by Paraná River, as you see, and Carcaraña, so it is a more temperate uh, weather with less frost. Some uh, background information as for this station. First time this was detected was in 2003, 2004, when samples were sent from the corn network at the time, coming from a sample from the station, experimental station, and a site at Venado Tuerto. I was not working with the team, but I was finding out. Then in 2011, 2012, the phytopathologists Maria Lago and Carlos Gamundi from the station, the entomologist, they have found and detected this disease. The vector is a species that they were studying and they that is found every year at the traps together with other types of leaf hoppers. We have found these pathogens in the past as well. Before moving on to the, this campaign, let's check the previous campaign to prepare the scenario. This was a campaign that was impacted by hydric stress and uh, people turn mostly towards late sitting. There was stepped sitting because of irregular rain uh, working in pulses according to the hydric state condition of the lot. And in autumn and winter, we had lower frequency and magnitude of uh, frosts. We see here that agrometeorological frosts were minor, were lower. We can say than the absolute uh, frost, the meteorological ones. So we can see in general that this campaign uh, did not have a harsh winter added to what we said before. It's better explained like this. These are comparative uh, tests at INTA. The first corn was lost, unfortunately, with the seeding date of October 17. We did late corn on September 27. That was pretty much commit, uh, compromised uh, in terms of quantity and quality. And we call, uh, we did another one, uh, ultra late, we called it, in January 26, 2023, hybrids with a certain relative maturity. And you can see that here on the right, a hybrid with relative maturity of 128, a long cycle hybrid, ended up with a black layer and ended up being filled or uh, reached June 14 without uh, relevant frosts. So by mid-June, we can say we had corn with green leaves in the field. Now, current campaign, 2023-2024, what happened? We were monitoring foliage diseases and by the end of December, beginning of January, together with a new Agronom, agriculture engineer, Paula Cola Haddad. She was an intern before we were studying the what is normal, Rocha, some tissue a little bit. And we saw the Fumagina. We also saw the Dalbulus Madis leaf hopper, but without foliage symptoms of corn stunting at all. But at the end of January, we started seeing the most evident symptoms, the reddening, the fine striation, 
and the exaggerated prolificity, stunting, a lot more. We received visits and people took um, samples from phytopathology from Pergamino, Hernan and Agustina came, and we started seeing the possibility that we have the pathogen, these pathogens at our experimental station. So we use what Maria Paz presented. We worked with assessment of 52 tempered hybrids. In average, we have 3.25 severity and a range that went from 125 to 4.65, very much um, affecting and compromising the plants. We want to be cautious still, but I wanted to give you this information. And to supplement the information of characterization, we supplemented this with the assessment of the spikes proposed by a uh, Ponzo with a master's thesis to measure the spikes. And we are assessing this work and we are seeing how applicable and useful this could be to have as a scale for characterization and to estimate the losses in yield. We have seen this for the first corn. The pressure was not so big, and as the weather was benign, we did not have heat waves, it was not typical January, it was not so affected, but the late one that was to be seated on January 21st, right there, together with the first corn, we had a high pressure of this. Even this is uh, even later than a late seating and this is what we have seen an estimation we in v6 we saw that there were more than six individuals and we have seen uh, per bad and we have high temperature all above 30 and heat waves of over 37 degrees and a moderate hydric stress we can say incidence and severity, at least preliminary, then we'll be more cautious when uh, sharing the figures, were higher to the first one that is seen at plain sight. We have had a great day with PASS uh, showing her this test and the symptoms, unlike the first test, we didn't have to wait. We started us from vegetative state. We saw the stunting, the exaggerated prolificity, philolia, these little leaves in the spikes, multiple spikes, very purple, intense purple color, the striation quite marked, and symptoms in the roots, in the anchoring roots, as you see. Not all hybrids are the same. Some seem to behave better than the others. This is confused also with high pressure of buds that there was and some white spotting also. So it's all mixed up for the time being, but we wanted to show you a bit what we are seeing in this campaign and where the data will be coming from. híbridos y la estimación de, de mermas de rendimiento, sumarnos a esfuerzos que, que con evaluadores calificados tanto dentro de la institución como fuera de la institución y eh, utilizar el marco de la red nacional de maíz y el programa de mejoramiento de maíz para eh, establecer eh, sitios donde evaluadores, evaluadores calificados puedan ayudarnos a, a generar evidencia científica tanto al seguimiento de la enfermedad como al manejo del vector. Eso sería todo. Muy bien, muchas gracias. That will be all. Now, Solana, thank you, Facundo.
I will share. Let me know if you can hear me. Please speak up. We don't hear you clearly. Her connection's not good. Se ve perfecto. Acércate, por favor, el micrófono lo más posible. Bueno, eh, buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Solana Good Rodríguez. Morning, everyone. Y actualmente me encuentro como becaria doctoral con ICER, en el doctorado en ciencias biológicas en la facultad en la universidad. I am working at the doctorate at the Tucumán National University. Say, I'm working in the thesis at Chacon Semi Arid Animal Research Institute, the IIACS, in the project for genetic improvement of rice, corn, and sorghum. Just to let you know, we have what we have been doing at the Institute, the general project for the improvement of corn is to obtain germo high productivity germoplasm of tropical corn with behavior with biotic and abiotic stresses, quality differentiated, adapted to productive systems of the north e west of Argentina. I'm working at the thesis for the development of QPM corn. If you don't know about QPM, QPM have a double content of two essential amino acids that are alicin and cyptopine, essential for the feeding of monogastric animals and also for human beings. These corns are not GMO. They were obtained as from a natural mutation. And the other work line in my thesis is the assessment and characterization of the source of natural resistance with a plague we have in the north of our country. As Facundo said, we need to see what we have observed, what we have done in the campaign in complying with the objectives for the program. We carried out the setting of comparative yielding tests for experimental hybrids in the program, as well as QPM hybrids. These tests were carried out all under same management conditions, only one seeding date, same plant density, same seed curing, same fertilization doses, same controls of insects and weeds in the whole lot. It is important to comment that these observations are specific for the conditions of this year at the inter-experimental field and for specific management of the crop. We cannot extrapolate these conditions to other situations, of course not uh, for this management, nor as relates to environmental conditions. We want to say that the general objective of the program was not the assessment of the set of pathogens that produce corn stunting, nor its vector Dalbulus medis, but we were impacted by this situation. So it was interesting, uh, we believe, to show you what we have observed. Here we see comparative yield studies that are in the field right now. This, uh, here you see all of the different pictures. You see the seeding date here, January 24 in 2024. We see the stage of these materials, R4 to R5. On the left, you can see experimental hybrid that is tropical, working if in the INTA improvement program. And, and to the right, you see the tempered witness. The witness was for the, the comparison in yield. And in this case, it helped us to compare the symptoms. 
On the right, we have the tempered witness on the left and on the right, the Hesper experimental hybrids, in this case, the QPM uh, in my thesis work plan. Focusing on symptoms briefly, because this was very well explained before, just simply to make a comparison to the left, we see the tempered materials with symptoms that had to do with constanting uh, to the right, the ex tropical experimental. Here we see the canopy in the lots. Here you see the tropical hybrid. We have covered here the striation and the tempered witness to the right. Over here we have a general way to show the symptomatology that was most observed. You see the yellowing uh, coloration and the redding, the reds uh, that we see on the tempered cases. Uh, you see the symptoms on the root, tempered on the right, as Macundo says, with this proliferation of roots as for the anchorage roots, very marked as we see. And to the left, tropical material, where you don't observe this proliferation of roots, even when I'm going to say that we, I have observed this in many cases, but to a much lesser extent. Good. Here we see the symptoms on the spikes, tempered on the left, typical proliferation of spikes. Here we see the marked problem for the determination, the number of grains, problems in the filling as well, spikes that did not formed any grains, these only a few, as you see. On the right, experimental tropical hybrids from the program with normal development of the spike with grains, and to the time being, normal filling of the grains, even when, as I said, this crop is at R4, R5, it's not finished yet, so we can still uh, we cannot say how uh, this will end. Here we see this was done last week. Six spikes from six different hybrids from our program from last week. You see normal development of hybrid and the tempered witness on the top that were together with these materials with this feature of smaller development of the spike. To the left, we can see the tempered uh, witness uh, corn. Um, to the right, a, a QPM hybrid with rather normal development. And to the right, a spike sampling where you can see the third and the fourth um, are uh, the QPM. And the one I'm pointing at is the tempered witness sample. Well, this is just to tell you that at IACS, we have performed preliminary uh, tests on this disease, on this pathogen. As Dr. Peggy told at the very beginning, this did not caught us unawares because uh, many studies and tests had been carried out. By 2024, we had performed an early assessment of the corn stunt pyroplasm CSS in Tucuman by Dr. Vecchi, and also agronomist Luis Jerónimo Gomez, who 
was one of the forefathers of the genetical improvement of tropical corn in Argentina with different uh, developments of varieties like age 40, age 45, and one of the most renowned of the uh, Leales 25. So far, we still find it in producer plots. These researchers already told us for the 2002 season, a spiroplasm incidence of 72%. And if we compare it with incidence values for other uh, localities, this is one of the highest. Another work telling us about the presence of the vector and of the disease in Tucumán and here, specifically for Intaleales, this uh, study already showed us back in 2002 the positive presence of the vector, the presence of uh, spiroplasm, of cytoplasm, and um, a mosaic presence as well. The percentage of incidence for spiroplasm reached uh, values around 100%. The idea of this background was to show you that uh, expert witness, agronomist uh, Luis Geronami already proved in 1990-1991 the germoplasm available in the institution for spiroplasm tolerant species. And to sum up and to conclude my presentation, the symptoms we observed in plants match the ones described for the set of diseases conveyed by Dalbolus mitis. Given the problems created by this disease in this season, we need to stress the differential behavior observed in tropical experimental hybrids vis-a-vis -vis temperate witness samples from PDMG inter under the same pressure of the vector. As I told you uh, some slides ago, we need to wait till these materials complete their cycles and get to harvest to determine different levels of interaction between the plant pathogen and the vector. And just a, a message, not all tropical genetics are tolerant, but there are within this some sources of variability uh, variability to be tolerant to this complex. And uh, where are the next steps? The idea behind all these um, observations, even if that was not at the source of this project, this is something we need to tap into to come up with new objectives. And so we need to identify genotypes with good grain production and integrity to a harvest adapted to the north of our country to continue assessing its behavior for the following season. We need to detect tolerance in parent lines that can contribute to, to the development of uh, good performance materials given the stunting situation. We need to also assess um, crop uh, management tools and mainstream technologies that allow for an accurate approach to the available genetics behaviors within IAX. And all of that will help us identify alternatives that help us uh, come up with a comprehensive handling of these diseases. Genetic on its own will not solve the problem. And as it was mentioned, all the cultural and biological handling we need to bring into the picture so that we can control this disease. And I think it is important to highlight here that both private companies, public uh, agencies, producers, everybody needs to work together in an articulate fashion to come up with a speedy solution given this situation that has impacted so much corn production for this season. And that would be everything on my side. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Solana. And with this, I give the floor to Jorge Mercado's presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, please, Solana, you need to stop sharing your screen so that uh, Jorge can start sharing his.
¿Me escucha bien y se ve la presentación, Eduardo? Can you hear me and can you see my presentation? Y yes. Uh, go ahead. Well, so the idea of my presentation is to go through the incidents in uh, water uh, stress and high temperatures impact uh, um, the, the season for 2023-2024. I work at Inta San Luis. Uh, I'm part of the program of ecophysiology. So let us have a look at the corn cycle. The crop develops its foliar area, intercepts the light, and with that energy, it creates performance and develops the grains. In order to do that, corn has uh, to resort to water, and water coming from raindrop uh, goes to the roots, and if the soil permits it, it can get as far down as two meters from the surface. So from sowing to harvest here at the very end, there is a key stage in which the grains are developed, especially in this part here where a number of grains end up being said that depends on the growth. It depends on the intersection with its foliar area and uh, on the fact that the photosynthesis device works correctly. So the growing of these grains starts. What does it mean that the grains need to feed during the filling from this source based on the set grains? And this is what at the end of the day will produce results. And this is the value we have uh, from the institution that we are present across the territory covering different specialities. And we can see the number of members contributing to this work. So we are going to start with what happens in uh, early stages. We can have water uh, restrictions that result in less foliar development. So when stress uh, happens between uh, V6 and V7, the uh, step is shorter. So given the size of the plant, you can see in which point there was water stress. Here you can see some of the pictures. This is a gradient towards the end of the lot. Another picture here, which clearly it uh, depicts uh, the situation of the soil or early water stress in the province of San Luis, with, uh, which results in plants with very short stems, in this case, across the plant. This can happen in corn growing uh, for water stress, and this can result in corn stunt, which is a topic that has gathered us here today. Here, we can see that uh, water limitations not only result in uh, leaf development issues, but also it decreases the efficiency of the photosynthesis, resulting in smaller spikes. So we can see these ones that are not fully developed, depending on the density and on a number of factors we can see that these spikes are not full in their development. Something else we can observe in this stage is not only the effect of drought, but also that of high temperatures. That is, temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius, and this results in tissue damage, which can uh, affect different processes. One of them is the efficiency in terms of photosynthesis. That is, the crop operates at a lower efficiency. That is, it is damaged as a result of these very high temperatures. And specifically, one of the things that can happen uh, as we can see in this picture is that we uh, have effects that result in sterile pollen. And when this pollen 
uh, goes into the female flower, results in sigma portrait, and there are no uh, grain formations happening. So we can see these uh, sparse grain formation. That is, some grains are missing. This is a result of very high temperatures when it is coming out. In this specific condition, because um, we might have a plant that was growing very well, but then something happens and um, we, with the panicle, and we can see um, a situation of a plant that was uh, doing very well, but because of this, uh, he, extreme heat, we can see some reddening of the leaves and some other plant parts of the plants. Instead of uh, being translated to the grains, this results in these uh, red color inserts. And uh, more advanced in the cycle, once the grains are fixed, the grains need to be filled and water limitation may result in to the reduction of photosynthesis. And if uh, on top of water limitations and high temperatures, we have a reduction in photosynthesis efficiency and increase in uh, breathing costs and also because of high temperatures per se. And so we have a lesser source that is the same source serves a lesser purpose. And with a higher demand, the corn plant delivers everything it has to the grains, but the filling does not get to the final stage. That is the stage is shortened. That is, when the plant is out of resources, it does not develop the grains, it does not fill the grains to the full. So the um, black layer Facundo was just showing us. When the source is out and the filling is shortened, the crop does not get to the very end. Something else that can happen is that the crop was very well, it grew fast, and it happens with some very high material from tropical or temperate areas, uh, which, for example, grow very well early on. For example, in this case, the V20, they grow fast and the stems are thin. And in case of wind, for example, in March, end up being uh, tilted or broken rather than tilted. They break. But what happened in this season? Let me remind you. We started the 23-24 campaign with water up to two meters. You see the scars of the previous season that uh, left the Pampian or the Chaco region in very bad conditions. And this, in some of the areas, condition for the, sow, uh, the corn sowing and restricted the uh, corn plant growing in some regions. Let, let me show you the central area in our country. In this image here, you can see from yellow to red um, colored areas where the filling is uh, from 50 to even 10%. And this restricts the capacity to expand, creating stress on corn cultures. In this central uh, strip, well, let me rewind here. I said that it conditioned the area of the Parana River. Uh, water stress remained there till the end of November. So in many of the regions, I am showing you just one. So sowing is uh, rather less. It was very difficult to perform an early sowing, even though that happened in some limited cases. But for this season, in, in some regions, there was 
some late sewing, some uh, staggered sewing. So we, when we get to the uh, sewing at the end of November or, or early December, the blossoming happens in mid-January and uh, as up to 20, 25th of February. And the situation was that we had very high temperatures that was uh, general. But if we focus in these areas, that is the west of the province of San Luis, of uh, La Pampa, also the north part of the province of La Pampa, uh, the, a great part of the core area was lacking water. And in that specific window, uh, around the end of January and the first days of February, be we had between 5 to 15 days of a very high temperature. That is in excess of 35 degrees Celsius. The plant cannot sweat, it cannot cool down, and as a consequence of all that, it is damaged. That was one of the consequences of the season linked to a thermal and water stress. Something else I wanted to point out was that for some culture sold at the beginning of January in the province of um, Santiago del Estero, west, also east, parts of Chaco, there was low availability of water. That is, they had water restrictions. And there were also very high temperature events between 5 and 25 days or very high temperature within this window of 45 days. But there were also average days throughout these 40 days in excess of 26 and even 28 degrees Celsius that impaired the efficiency of the photosynthesis mechanism. So, up. Besides constant for this season, we had water stress. So let me tell you that drafts and very high temperature limit and reduce the yield with symptoms that are common to other factors. We see uh, stands, uh, spares, uh, reddening, uh, early yielding, broken corn, or even uh, tilted. For the 23-24 season, we had water difficulties in very areas which conditioned the sowing and it limited the um, corn harvest. There were restrictions in terms of yield, also in the grains, in the size of the spikes, the low efficiency of the photosynthesis. And in turn of the disease that has gathered up here today, it was key because we need to learn together and act better vis-a-vis -vis the next campaign. And with this, I want to thank you all. Thank you very much, Jorge. And with this, we complete the second item on the agenda that has to do with what happened in this campaign. And with this, we move to another section referring to harvest issues. And with this, we give the floor to uh, Scaramuso, Ferraguti, and Radisami. Thank you very much. Let me share once again. Can you see it? Are we okay? Yes, we are. Sorry for this delay. All right. So, so, so far, so good, we're reaching the end. What happens? It's all nice, but we need 
to harvest our crop. It is such a an issue and what we need to see what happens with the affectation, the impact of the because of the weather and also because of the corn stunting. We're going to do this very fast. It's going to be just a review of what Jorge and Paz um, presented this. We know the plants need solar light for photosynthesis. This happens in the leaves. It accumulates in the assimilates, nourishing the growth of the bodies. Facundo, you are not showing your presentation. Let me do this once again. Let me try to do this once again. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. All right, and I'm sorry for that. So we were saying that we have the photo assimilates accumulated on the leaves, derivated then to the bodies in growth, depending on the time of the culture in vegetative will go to the stem, roots and leaves, and in reproductive stage, it goes into the spikes and grains. What happens as with past showed when the phloema, the tissue conducting all the assimilate, assimilates is blocked due to this pass, pathogens, like this case, the spiroplasm. If the phloem is blocked, we'll see the reddening shown. And if that is combined with other pathogens in the complex, like with the fine trade, you will see a further reduction of the transportation and we'll see, as Jorge shown, because of the weather and the patho pathology, an impact in the flow of assimilates and it will be filled in with remobilization or with what it can do as regards photosynthesis contemporary to the filling. And what will happen, the main symptom, the stunting. If the low is limited in the vegetative stage, we will see stunting, shorter plants. We also have the exaggerated prolificity. As past shown, many spikes in different nodes. Some might be feasible, some others won't. Um, these other type bouquet type multi spikes, as in difference with mm, profi prolificity is the way that they will all come as from the same node. We see that the assimilate flow might not be stable enough and we'll, we see what Jorge has shown, an interruption of the filling of the grains and anticipated or earlier maturity. If the reserve from the stem participated much, the, it will mean a broken stem. And if the anchorage is affected, as Solana shown, of we have problem of susceptibility. In the turns, we will see the overturn. This is not mutually excluding, and this is serious. If we have stunting, we have heterogeneity of the plants. That's not so good. Uh, serious, but what is serious is the height of the spikes. If we talk about the gathering, the header, the heading device should be at a certain stage. Exaggerated prolificity, many spikes in many nodes might provide some grain, most of them in general don't. The same with multiple spikes in generally there are no feasible grains in them. What happens with early maturity? Well, once again, we'll have the scheme on the left, looking to simplify what you see on the right, that uh, normally the pictures are not 
so clearly seen. So you have the drawing. What happens with the anticipated maturity? In the spikes, the grain was interrupted in its filling at some point. The spike A, as we see, we could think is the one that reaches physiological maturity. Then as time goes by, as from R1, there is a stage where you don't see a lot of weight gaining, but as from there, 10, 12 days after R1, the weight starts growing linearly until phys physiological maturity is reached when the grain will not fill, be filled anymore. In case of A, that happened. If there are assimilates missing, and if there was stress from the environment, on top of that, you can end up with B, with lower grain weight, or if it is very serious, it ends up being like C. Uh, the filling is stopped at a very early stage. All these lives together within the crop. So we end up with differences like this in sizes of the grain, humidity and quality. This was shown, this is a scale proposed for characterizing hybrids and shrinkage. The uh, first group, the GO is non-affected, G1 is was shrinkage of between one to 20%. And we see group one uh, proposed this category. Uh, you see that the spike becomes in a cone shape uh, because the flow of assimilates are towards the uh, um, grains in the middle and the tip of the witness. And there we see premature maturity and exaggerated prolificity. Even when we have three of these, we have the issues that Solana mentioned as well and pass because the cob is more corky, smaller grains. You need to have very fine regulation to use them, and this will mean an overload in the threshing and cleaning system. One of the serious things we see that in, it has to do with having different maturity in the crop is that the spikes with anticipated maturity are a lot more exposed to the climate. Now, in autumn, these spikes start sprouting. They have a lower hectolitric weight and their commercial quality is affected because they have more damaged grain, sprouted grains, moldy grains, and roti, roti grains. Something I forgot to say during the grains filling is not only the gaining of weight, reaching Physiological maturity implies also reaching the stage with mechanisms that inhibit germination. Grains that are fold in half, the mechanisms are less present and they are more prone to sprouting and they will be exposed to the weather waiting for the other spikes to reach maturity. So what happens with this? This affects the inequity. That is to say, the affected grains start accumulating fungi and mold. Some were affected, some will be uh, generating all of these mycotoxins that we see, fumionicines, here alinons that contaminate the food for the human beings. So to speak about the consequences of these pathogens and the environment, climate environment, I will leave you with Fer Escaramusa. He will discuss regulations in order to work with these crops, with these type of crops that are affected with the pathogens. Fernando, yes, thank you, Facundo. My name is Fernando Escaramusa. We are here at Inta Manfredi. The idea is to talk about these conditions that we're finding, actually. Next slide, please. 
we will see what we can do as regards the conditions that we have. Next slide, please. It is not changing. It is not changing, right? No, it is not. Will you stop uh, sharing and I will share it? All right, we'll do that. Well, sorry. I will leave I'll be back in a second. There you can share it, Facu, uh, Fernando. Great. We have tried this before, but it did not work. No problem. All right, so can you see now? Yes. As we were saying, with the conditions that were explained through the webinar, we need to go into the lot for harvesting, in this case, if we can do so. And we see that we have the need of carrying out a measurement of the losses, both for pre-harvesting as well as the losses at the harvesting time. Where do we find the losses? Well, in a normal situation, we see that normally they happen more at the head and less on the tail. Now, being this the situation, how it, what are we going to find at the pre-harvesting? At pre-harvesting, we will find spikes that are fallen from the plant on the ground that cannot be picked up. And we'll also find plants that are turned to the side, fallen, and cannot be reached, many of them by the head, and these will be pre-harvesting losses. According to the assessment methodology carried out many times by INTA Institute through different PRECOP and PROPECO projects, tab established a way of making these calculations of the pre-harvest loss. This methodology has to do with the width of the uh, harvesting machine and the spacing in between the rows or lines. Considering all this, as Facundo says, things will be complicated for the harvest. What are we to do? First, to check the general condition of the head, lower the position of the head as horizontal as we can, accommodating uh, it, and we need to decrease the speed of driving the harvesting machine, the harvester. So when we go slowly, we need to coordinate also tangential speed of the head. That is to say, the lifting chains and the uh, rolling bearings in the head. After this, what will we find? Well, we will actually find in the harvester a lot of non-grain material, weak cobs, light and damaged grains. We will have problems with the separation of the grains, with the refreshing. Also, the quality will not be the best. We need to reconfigure, readjust uh, all of the work and the separation and cleaning. It will depend on each harvester, of course, and depends on the lot where we are at. But how do we make this measurement for the configuration of the machine for it to work properly well? As from the assessment of crops, we have this tool, we need to use it very closely, and it consists in 
four rings, 56 centimeters in diameter. Three of them need to be uh, use and one of them needs to be in the belly of the harvester as we normally call it what will we find we'll find grains that are above the ring that we have shown there we'll find the losses from the tail and under that we will find all of the losses due to the head in relation to this and the methodology that was described before is that you see in pre-harvest that we are looking for how many uh, corns were thrown away or falling from the head and the losses caused by the pre-harvest. According to this, we'll see about the configuration and the fine tuning that will be required at the harvester. We need what we need to highlight here is that the tolerance we INTA has established in normal conditions had to do 150 kilos per hectare. Now, with this situation, we need to agree on a new tolerance that will be very much related to the conditions found in the lot. What tools do we have as from precision harvesting to help us out with the situation? Well, harvesters do have yield monitors and very recently harvesters also have made progress in automation. They do have information that is very necessary to continuously see in the monitors what's going on to have a better regulation and we have instant yield humidity in real time flow you know the conditions for the harvest as uh, it happens and we can see real time pictures of the quality achieved by the harvester according to this you can also have some self-regulations to be carried out. In this case, it's not most advisable to have uh, automatic harvesting. We need to see about that. We're only now uh, finding out about all these and working with all this, but all of the information generated as from yield maps perhaps might not be useful at the moment of making decisions on how to set up the lot, but this is all to be taken into account for future decision making. What happens is actually is that we need to know that the harvester will not fix what happens at the cultivation cycle. So as final considerations, let me leave you with this. We need to make pre-harvesting assessments at least in two different sites, as the INTA indicates. It is cumbersome, but you need a site representative of the lot and another that's more turned and we to have an idea of what we have of pre-harvesting losses. And we need to regulate the speed of the machine. That's very important when you do that. You will have to be paying attention in regulating also tangential speed of the rolling devices and the change that are lifting the head, monitoring periodically the losses from the harvest because we'll try to gather as much as grain as possible, but we will be preventing the generation of future hosting plants. We need to pay attention to that and also to, gen to make a team with the workers and those making the assessment, quantitative and qualitative assessment of the losses that will improve the performance of the machine. So finally, uh, let me say that with the passing of the mach harvesting machine, the harvester, we are preparing the bed for the next seeding. So the dispersion of the, all of that waste is very important for the next campaign to have good quality in the next uh, seeding campaign. These are 
the recommendations we have in relation to the harvesting of grains. I will stop sharing my presentation so that we will hear from Alejandro about if Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yes, you need to just switch into presentation mode. Very well, then let us talk further now. As you all know, this is uh, food for animals. Even if grains are, this is even more so to feed animals. Um, my name is Alejandro Radri Sani. I am in charge of the um, uh, of the further forage program within the pastizales, which is at the core of the uh, corn stunting issue. When we talk about uh, forage, uh, we have three systems in Argentina. That is um, uh, um, uh, uh, putting into silos, uh, most of, uh, shepherding, and uh, round bales of hay. According to the Chamber of uh, Forage, there are uh, 190 thousand hectares out of the 7.5 hectares we have of corn in Argentina that accounts for 20 percent other goes to hay making which is a low uh, share of that and the, the rest goes into grazing uh, some producers so corn if they don't have enough input for deferred uh, grazing on also uh, it serves a twofold purpose when corn and all is not doing well we use it for grazing when this issue struck we um, considered if there was any issue with uh, getting intoxicated uh, regarding uh, what has been explained it does not result into any toxicity for animals. As Facundo said, there might be other issues, for example, mycotoxins uh, linked to the treatment itself. Let us dwell now uh, with the recommendations for uh, putting into silos. Most common thing is that we see dry uh, matter in, in the leaves and that makes uh, producers anticipate it's grinded. But this is not convenient because we will end up with more than 70% of humidity present in the plants, which is not good for fermentation, let alone for yielding because we would be putting water into silence. So you do not need to uh, look the leaves but the stems for that. A practical way to do it is to remove the stems from the plant and squeeze them to check if water is coming out. If water is coming out, this is the situation in which it is too early to grind it. And uh, we need to pay attention not to grind too late in the process because if we have less than 60% water uh, or 38%, it makes compacting and putting into silos more complicated. We could reduce the size of the grinding, but we would be ending up losing the quality of the digestible fiber. If uh, some plants are down, this is an issue. We need to bring them up, maybe using the rotatory uh, header of the harvester, according to what Fernando said. But this is something to be negotiated on with the um, contractor because it's something difficult, but we could do it the other way around of uh, the direction in which the plants are down. We could also use uh, direct cutting headers. Uh, we don't have the time now, but there are some videos available in which you can see that the plants are uh, very well lifted using these headers, or they can use other um, machines. For example, uh, what is used for alfalfa, if you have these tools available in the field. Some other problem 
uh, according to what has been said, um, it's better to inoculate. And what is positive is that over the last two years, the percentage of silos being inoculated has gone up. We are around 50% of the inoculated silos, and this has to do with draft. The stunting shares some features with uh, the consequences of draft. So in order to improve fermentation, some producers are already inoculating and we should go uh, the same path. And we need to improve energy complementation because probably we will end up with a silo low on air energy, which uh, calls for some uh, supplements. The, the normal practice uh, in terms of uh, making uh, balls or, or rolls of haze, that is the most common practice if the culture is fully dry. For example, in the province of Santiago del Estero, most corn was already dry in February. In that case, rolls can be created uh, given the uh, emergency of uh, the emergence of early attacks. Uh, where it is not convenient to resort to this practice is, for example, in, uh, an intermediate situation with uh, silage and hay. And this is a common practice in the south of Chile that consists in putting hay within bags where it is green so that it can be preserved. And the best way to use corn is through uh, grazing. The recommendation here is to graze as soon as possible because an affected plant will lose quality both in the stem, in the leaves, because of all the reasons that were uh, just referred to. Grazing as intensively as possible, that is at ground level, even if that goes um, against the coverage, it lets us get as most material as we can, the spikes, the grains, the stems, the leaves. And in this way, um, we get uh, the um, uh, an advantage in connection with the grazing material used for animals that then become the host for the leaf hoppers. And for example, um, if we have corn that is fertilized, that is set for high yield, and there is an interruption in the cycle, there might be a high concentration of nitrates, nitrates both in the stem and in the leaves. And if there is any suspicion of that being the case, it would be advisable to test for nitrates to avoid any intoxication. Well, uh, I conclude on this note, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much to the team dealing with the issues around harvest. And with this, we move to the final part that has to do with any reflections we can uh, drive vis-a-vis uh, -vis the future. And uh, for this, we will have a panel made up of Juan Pablo Ioele, and some of the members who will take questions before we take uh, questions from the public, Macarena Casus, Marcelo Hueta, and Macarena. You have the floor. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, yes. Okay, so I will jump start with my presentation because we are uh, not doing so well time-wise. The idea for this panel is to bring together everything we have dealt with so far to come up with scenarios so that we can get responses from the experts, Maria Paz, Marcelo, and Macarena, who will give us a master's based on everything we have gathered in order to get ready for the future. From this outlook uh, covering the extension, myself being on the core area and discussing it with experts. 
uh, previously, and I am talking about this uh, with a slide from Marcelo Reta. This is a disease around the 30th parallel. And as Marcelo says, we have a transition area between parallels 30 and 32. That is the most advanced for the corn cycle. This is normally late or low risk. So let us see what could have been the situation here. As part of the questions we received based on the emergence of the pathosystem, we have gathered uh, what came from other institutions and from what we gathered in different agencies. The assumptions are around this, a reduction in frosts over the last winters, a deficient control of orphan corn, a green uh, bridges service coverage, and I made a survey on this, increase of late uh, sowing, less use of total um, uh, pesticides, and staggered sowing. If you have a look at the um, left chart, regarding the increase of late harvesting, less sowing, we can see that the uh, sowing intention grows and how staggered the area is based on the dates. So what happens climate-wise? This was provided to, to us uh, by uh, Climate and Water as a preview. For the core area, we can see a different scenario as that wall, uh, as the one from May, June, July from the previous season. For this next season, we expect uh, more cold temperatures and normal conditions for the whole uh, map of that region. And based on that, we can see that some situations arise in terms of the increase of population, temperatures, and longevity, as uh, the two speakers mentioned. Let us remember that low temperatures go against the growth of the populations, but it increases the longevity of sheltered females, according to the literature. So this is something we need to consider. And in connection with water for the core area between uh, yesterday until Friday, we received from 120 to 193 millimeters. Going further north, rain uh, falls are uh, stronger. So it is uh, high likely that we will find uh, uh, corn sowing uh, date more significant than for the previous campaign. If we now move to the sowing date, we will see that for the core area, we will see two different dates, early sowing and what is so-called late sowing. Late going for the core area, but uh, that is the normal sowing time for the northern area. And in the north, in the northeast and northwest, we see that this is late February. In Santiago del Estero, there is no staggering for sowing dates in February, and this is uh, rather concentrated in the months of December and January. But for the south area, with the center, uh, South Cordoba, and the center of Buenos Aires, as up to January for sowing dates. If we link the advancement of sowing times with the possibility or likelihood of having a winter crop sowing and sheltering areas based on the temperatures, we can start imagining different scenarios. This is just as a review, early corn in the core area. It wouldn't seem that we uh, have reasons to fear anything. And in a season in with the deceased affected the areas, uh, the, the sowing was not affected in terms of yield in most cases. Why am I coming up with this? We have lots of questions and fear from producers. They are even saying that they are not going to sow corn for this year, and we would like to 
come up with an answer. For early corn, there would be no issues. Even more so if we recapitulate the previous presentation when we discussed rainfalls. With this rainfall in April, around 200 millimeters, we have uh, not only uh, guaranteed that we will have more winter crops for the transition stage, but also the reservation for early sowing in August and early September, which uh, would counteract this fear of early sowing. Okay, so now let us leave the presentation mode to address questions. Is it correct? Okay. So, um, because you're here, Maria Paz Macarena, I am not sure if uh, Marcelo is here as well. Yes, Marcelo is here. So, after this brief summary and tapping into the knowledge from previous presentation, I am going to ask you the first question, Paz. Is there any background of a, any disease in Argentina similar to stunting? What is the context in Brazil and what do they do in case of these diseases? Well, uh, thank you very much, Juan Pablo. There are experiences of epidemics similar to this with other um, epistems, which is the Rio Cuarto disease. Uh, and we can refer to many epidemics like that. In the first one, we faced the same situation. We needed germoplast that was tolerant um, from then on. As of today, uh, the, the seeders continue to produce and to complete their germoplasms, addressing the diseases. As regards the spiroplasm, I don't think there is any experience with that, especially given the size of the population of leaf hoppers for this season. Based on what we said in 1990, 1991, um, we found the stunting for the first time in Argentina. 96, 97 was a significant point in the Rio Cuarto disease, if you remember. So taking the scope of that disease, we found out how the stunting was spreading. And as of 2000, we considered stunting from the 30th parallel northwards. From 1996, 1997, the stunting takes the whole of the north of Argentina. From then to the year 2000, it covers the north of Argentina with significant surprises because we get the most powerful hybrids, but the stunting was limiting it. At that same time, in Brazil, there was an epidemic. I'm talking about season 96-97. In the year 2000, there were other epidemics, and they have epidemics every three to four years, strong epidemics. They have a high level of inoculus, but strong epidemics every three to four years. So, whereas Brazil was undergoing the first uh, strong epidemics, they had the first strong uh, uh, record of an epidemic in Colombia and in Costa Rica. So it's as if somehow the weather allows for the vector populations multiply enough to result in epidemics. And this issue comes down from Costa Rica to Colombia. It went down to Brazil and 20, 25 years later, we in Argentina are encountering the same situation in temperate areas. This is something we were not expecting or in that transition area you just mentioned. This is the background I have, and that is why we were expecting the surprise. Yeah, go ahead. A very clear pass. Let me uh, build on what you just said to all three of you. 
And let me come back to what I put up for the presentation. Based on this growth of the winter uh, crop we have, and based on this displacement of the um, pest uh, to more temperate areas, could we think of uh, closer uh, uh, hot spots for the next season in those crops that are um, operating as shelters? Marcelo? You go for it. So uh, regarding the endemic areas from the parallel third to the north and to the south, uh, currently these uh, crops are not being delivered. So what the uh, Talum is doing is to uh, go through this period Sorry, the audio is getting interrupted. So uh, either they find shelter or they migrate. So what do we know about Dalbunus? We can see it for the corn bud, and now we saw it on the wheat bud as well and others. So when temperatures go down, they are going to find shelter below cultures. If green cultures are a better, a better shelter, what we know is that um, if a talbolus is without food in a wet environment, it's not the same as if it's without food in a dry environment. If it's a wet environment, it can survive longer. Unfortunately, I had some connectivity issues, and I'm sure you mentioned it, it but uh, we know that there is uh, some that feed only on corn. So what is Dalbulus now doing? It is migrating. We know that this is uh, very susceptible to high temperatures. We know there are uh, registers and references of temperatures around two degrees or three degrees for two or three days where dull bullos dies. There are different types of populations and some are more temperature resistant. But uh, at the end of the day, the dull bullos is mutating at what is the natural situation is that low temperature linked to lack of food makes population of Dalbulus no longer there. But uh, talking about the endemic area, we are going to find it, but it ha because it has always been there. But moving from parallel 30 downwards, most likely that population of Dalbulus, uh, according to our consideration so far, are going to disappear. We depend on uh, other factors. But Macarena or Maria Paz, Macarena, would you like to go for it? Take the floor, please. Like to know. It's very clear the way Marcelo explained. Nothing to add. All right. So third questions that we have received. We have talked about the scenario. What can happen as from the plague and pest? What actions can producers carry out to have more or less incidents? Do I respond? On the basis of what has been said in this webinar and considering the studies that we know of about the pest, the, the, it, the most important thing is to eliminate to have voluntary maize plants where the dalbulus remains in the system. That is the priority. And to establish that period of sanitary emptiness, more than 90 days, to contribute to decrease the population so from this pest in case there are no low temperatures, as Marcela mentioned, what we have been seeing here 
after year in this area is actually that with environmental conditions that we see in February in the winter, uh, this is not happening. In this last campaign, the winter itself, actually, it was very benign and it favored the pest. It favored the high populations of the vector in this endemic area. Perfect. Marcelo, is there anything you would like to add? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What the producer should do is to be committed to carry out the control of this voluntary maze and to keep the period of uh, sanitary precaution. Maybe it's not so easy in the transition area if we have a lot of winter crops uh, that becomes a refugee area with uh, orphan plants that we may have as well, independently from the control of orphan plants that we can do. But we need to be very attentive to what is spontaneous in most of the lots. Tell me. I have the opinion to separate ourselves from the different type of sorghum can, that can be planted, because if there is no corn, if there is no rye and oat, it will go to alfalfa. It will seek refuge in other plants and, and avicia. If it doesn't find wheat, it will go up to the hills. It will find shelter. It will find the shelter it needs independently from finding wheat or not. So all the populations we should, having lots of winter crops, will be the same to keep in the level of population that if it is all fallow land. Yes, independently. It is independent from the dalbolus. What is, but it is dependent on the orphan plants that Magarena mentions, or any other early corn that we may need. That sanitary gap of 90 days is important for each and every area. Depopulation for 90 days. Yes, we have an extensive maize production areas, you know, but specifically with will allow dalbulus. We know there's a lot of dalbulus. This is no news. It's normal for this time of the year, but we have a lot of infected dalbulus as we had a high incidence of the disease. If we want the infected populations to, lo to go down and a lot, it's what we said, a long, period without having the uh, maize crop and because that will help a lot. If it's very cold, we will have a shorter period without corn, without maize. But this reference period is 90 days, at least a minimum of 90 days without corn in wet environments, but could be more. It always remained in our system. What will actually have an impact is to stop corn for a, an extended period of time. To leave it without food, it will depend on the temperature helping us out for populations to decline even more. So on the basis of the uh, stronger winter that we expect to come, maybe the disease will uh, take longer to arrive or will not impact us as much. We'll have to see um, anything to add. I'm sorry I'm interfering. The colleagues in the panel, maybe you want to say a lot more, but we are half an hour over time. So we will now wrap up 
with this blog. This was the last blog where we were sharing our views on how to think for the future, for the immediate case and for the medium term as well. Now we will open the Q&A for the audience. We received um, an enormous amount of questions. We try to summarize them and group them. We will only cover three or four questions now. Uh, let me Remem remind you of the logical sequence of the webinar, starting telling you of what we knew already of this pathos system and its general features, second block, two sections explaining part of what happened. And in this last section, we're focusing on the reflections and what's going on in fa and facing what's coming. We this way, we have closed all of the presentations and now we open for a Q&A. First question selected from the audience. This is not specific question, but I'm summarizing several questions. It has to do with the following. What temperature kills the dalbulus? Do we need frost? What is the medium life of leaf hoppers? Three questions in one. So Please, uh, speakers, be very specific and brief. Naka. Marcelo has responded this before. He, I don't know if he wants to talk with this, it's better. He was covering it. Well, there are several references. Let's see. Temperature below zero, that's enough. Enough to generate a high mortality of dalbulus. And there is reference that under uh, or below 17, uh, that helps as well. Uh, this bug does not high low, light low temperatures. And medium life in this time of the year, winter time, 90 days, more than 90 days. Uh, I'm disconnecting, but that is when they have food, 35 to 45 days between male and female. Let me add something, Eduardo. We have analyzed the amount of frosts vis-a-vis -vis the presence of dalbulus mages in the winter, and we have seen that in our areas, in the years where we have 30 frosts, we did not find dalbulus till November. And in, unlike last year where we had only eight frosts, only in September we started having a dalbulus in the plants. So this needs to be checked area by area because in the core area where they have the problem, they should see what's their situation according to the environmental uh, and weather conditions of the area. Thank you so much for your response. Next question, summarizing interventions from the audience. Is it good to have residual insecticides application to decrease the population of leafhoppers so that next crop um, is better as from when we see the symptoms? Let me begin and you wrap up, Marcelo. This is my personal opinion. In this campaign, we have seen an erratic efficiency of all insecticides tested. All of the insecticide applications may not only at the level of a test, but also at the level of a producers. So I couldn't recommend you or tell you if this will be efficient to control the Talbolus Mades. We do not consider you need to focus on the chemical control on the play of the plague, but with a set of strategies that, that we have presented in the webinar. So this way you can decrease the population of the vector. Chemical control is only one part of everything that needs to be done to fight the vector and the incidence of the disease. Yes, I agree with her. 
we are talking about therapeuticals on seeds with the systemic action. Data says that there's control, uh, but and that one, it, it might kill it, but we need to be protected from the disease. So we need to see about the populational dynamics of the talbulus that it does not increase so fast. That would be a contribution of seeds therapeuticals. Then about emerging population, that's more complex because if Dalbulus populations are very high and you want to protect them chemically, it may fail. There are no guarantees that with chemical intervention you can protect the crop from the disease. Given the high efficacy Dalbulus has for transmission, their mobility, etc. So what we need to try is to generate a less favorable environment for the presence of the vector. And chemical treatments can be a supplement that may help out. Thank you so much. Now there is a question that's very much related to the previous one. So maybe you can just expand a bit on your answers. The question is, when you do the follow along when there is voluntary maize or orphan maize in order to fight leaf hopper, is it justified to apply an insecticide? I would le let the cold do its work. I think we need to think about that. We should think about that because if we have the um, voluntary plant, the of the males full of eggs will go there. So that's a line of study. It's a good line. The cold will hit both the leaf hoppers and the orphan plant. Well, both have survived in this campaign. We were harvesting and at Mar Chiquita Lagoon, we were sitting at Rafaela, right? So the exchange we are having illustrates the complexity of the issue. So there, is, there are no um, questions. There are no only very clear answers. We need to find out more information and gather more evidence to back up the decisions that are to be made to the future, just to add effectively. When we talk about chemical work, we suppose that all the rest was very well done. It's like there are no orphan plants that will be better. But if we have, if they are not killed by the cold weather, maybe there was early rain. The condition to have no orphan plants in the uh, field is very important. If we do that, it's much better. Something else you need to have into account, and it's no minor issue, is that all of those applications that you may be doing now to control Dalbulus maidis at the uh, greeneries will have an impact in the natural enemies that the, they may have, in particular parasites. That's no minor issue, and it can contribute to the control of this leaf hopper. There are I saw a question in YouTube that there are certain parasitoids uh, by Dr. Virla in the Tucuman area. In this campaign, we, were, we several of us researchers at ITA, at Rio Adriana Sauluso, and Diego, we, have, we were able to see this and to determine what are the species that we have been recording through the campaign here, you know, that we're attacking and predating Dalbulus maidis. We, there are studies that deserve to be carried out before uh, having um, a good application of insecticides in a preventive manner. Thank you very much. We remind you that uh, all the other speakers can also provide an answer. There's a question that were not part of the last section uh, in the panel can contribute with. Question is, how related is the breaking of the stem with constanting? Because in several communications, there is a direct relay, 
relation indicated. So any colleague that might talk about this might tell us. Well, I, I think, and I think uh, I tried to depict it when I showed the feeling, and that feeling that is shortened as a consequence of the deficiency for water stress or high temperatures, in general, it results in that shortening. And that shortening happens because the grains demand all the energy and that weakens the, the gain and results in the breaking. That is normal and general. Facunda said Jorge, but in our exchanges with Facu, we saw that one thing is for you to see the, the breaking of some isolated infected plants that can be linked to the pest itself, not necessarily uh, cyroplasm. But the staggered pattern could be linked to that, whereas a generalized pattern uh, forces us to think in terms of physiology. And something that is missing in Argentinian systems is nitrogen. So uh, you shouldn't even think that doesn't uh, is at the source of the breaking also. OK, thank you very much. Uh, something Solana showed is that there are differences in Anchorage. Uh, Anchorage is also responsible for tilting and not breaking. And I think this is linked to uh, the presentator presentations in the third block. In, in lots heavily affected, that is losses of yield, uh, fallen plants where the producer can no longer harvest it and there are spikes down. What, uh, what is your recommendation? Maybe Facundo, Alejandro or Fernando could um, take the floor. Well, uh, Fernando, we were discussing this yesterday. Would you like to say something about it? Yes, in fact, you are going to leave uh, some spikes and for economic reasons it is not justifiable to harvest it so i have seen that um, uh, many people uh, go for removing it and if it still stands the spikes will fall later on, resulting in many orphans, which will create some issues. So what is the best choice here? Well, it depends on the population, of course, but according to the population, maybe we can have a selective application. And that would be a more economic application, given the uh, amount of uh, pesticides or herbicides. So as part of the tools we have, the selective application is going to be one of the possibilities we have to deal with those orphans. Thank you very much, Fernando. And let us now address the last question from the audience because we are way ahead of our time. Can the same situation be expected in connection with the leaf hopper for next year? And the second part of the question is, could it be considered that Dalbulus nidis is here to stay? So, uh, Eduardo, let me make some clarification here, coming back to the previous question. When it is still standing, the best thing to do is to uh, leave it standing and do nothing to bring it down. That is considering that 90% of our area is for direct sowing. And in order to have a better quality sowing, the best thing to do is to leave it standing as it is. Thank you very much, Fernando. And with now, with this, let us see who would like to take the floor to answer the last question. Let us focus on the question. 
question uh, that is wide in scope. Is Talbulus uh, Naibis here to stay? Okay, I will take it. In the Journal of the Rural uh, Association of Jesus Maria in 2004, we uh, released a publication with that title. Is Delbulus Nidus here to stay? Corn stunting. Is it here to stay? That was the question in 2004. So your question. Is Delbulus Nidus here to stay? And the answer was yes. So from that, we wanted to find in what areas of the temperate area could the Delbulus be uh, their surviving winter. So the answer is shelter is required and shelter we have in every forest area, but there are more specific areas and it also needs water. It can um, go without food for three months, but it needs water. So in temperate areas, where is it that we have enough water and orphans or corn that uh, does not make up to the population. In the uh, Rio Negro valleys, I'm sure there is water and in, where it's very cold, I'm sure Talbulus is staying there. In the Sampacho area, probably it is cold, but Talbulus is staying, but it always comes up when we perform sampling. In, watering areas uh, where uh, corn is produced. I'm talking about uh, watering uh, cycles. I'm talking about sweet corn nurseries in watering areas and with corn for most of the time, Dalvulus is staying in tropical areas. And this is work done by INTA. So thank you very much for your answer. And with this, we close the Q&A session from the audience. And before our very brief uh, closing session, let me say that in connection with all, every concern in terms of chemical controls, especially from insects, we need to consider that Senasa, the um, uh, uh, food um, uh, and health safety agency is assessing the safety and we need to consider how we can address this issue considering every perspective that in connection with the selection of the tool for uh, integrated pest management so this has been a very nice, interesting experience, having all these points of view in an articulated fashion to build on joint work. So as a result of the presentations, we can derive how complex this issue is in terms of understanding causes and uh, consequences it results in, but not only in terms of how to overcome contingencies, but also how to address the next season and also in longer terms. From a very first layer of analysis based on the knowledge we have gathered in our own country and in other countries, because we are bringing together information from Brazil, from Mexico, who have had experiences with this issue. The dialogue uh, based on this complexity in different environments and production styles triggers new questions, as we have said, and these questions started to be addressed. Obviously, this work needs to continue. No doubt we are going to require a cross-disciplinary work with involvement of different actors from the private and public areas, and this is the path we are covering. This work has started spontaneously from different parts of our country because colleagues present in different provinces have responded uh, working together. Nevertheless, 
We consider that this articulated work needs to be systematized in order to come up with uh, robust solutions, as robust as possible for the sector. So these are the final considerations given the time constraints. And with this, we close this webinar. We would like to thank the participation of the audience in general, the support of Fontagro, which requested to participate and to give access to colleagues from different countries in Latin America. Thank you to all the speakers who have worked uh, jointly, collaboratively, and very generously, very selflessly. We would also like to thank the regional and research centers who have collaborated, the Climate and Weather Institute, Instituto de Clima y Agua, which has shared some uh, meteorological forecasts. And with this, we conclude the um, webinar it has been registered, recorded, and will be available on the YouTube channel of INTA. Eduardo, let me thank very specially Embrapa from Brazil, which very generously has always made information available and has helped us train on the topic they were way ahead. Perfect. Thank you very much, Paz. So, I echo uh, that recognition, and with this, we have concluded at least one first experience in mainstreaming different points of views, and we will work along those lines. Thank you very much, and see you next time. Thank you, Eduardo, and um, we welcome you on the um, uh, for the sessions of the 30th in Marcos Paz and uh, be um, expecting new releases of other instances. And let us start regional actions to coordinate things because one thing that has been clear is that one of the things we are missing is that regional coordination to address this issue. That requires time and making arrangements. So thank you all for being there. Thank you. Excellent work. Well done, Eduardo Trumper. Thank you for your time, Eduardo. Thank you.